we, we, uh, yeah. we choose you, Jesus. That's why we're here. We've chosen you. Amen. Just as, uh, do take your seats. I, I just felt this, this thought really coming. And, and I, I, how many people have been on holiday with friends or family this year? Okay. My guess is that was a careful choice. If you think about going on holiday and you want to be able to relax, you probably choose a little bit carefully. You probably don't choose the person you're always quarreling with, unless it's your wife or partner. <laughs> you, know, um, you, know, you, you, you choose people that you're going to be able to share a mutual enjoyment of the food and the place and all the other stuff. Is that, is that how it is? Yeah? And, and I guess, as we were just thinking, I choose to be holy, the book of Hebrews tells us that God has chosen to share his holiness with us. And holiness and holiday are all from the same root. It's about being set apart. We, we take some time apart to go away, to recreate, to refresh, to have fun, to be with people that we want to build with. God chooses to share his holiness with us. And, you know, our ways are not God's ways. Our ways are not always compatible. We, we're not always the kind of people that we think, God, if you're going to go on holiday, would you take us with you? But God says, I do. I, I want to take you with me. And actually... Today, God wants to take us with him. And even as, as Chris comes to speak to us, God wants to take us with the things that he's given Chris to share today. So, uh, well, I'll hand over to Chris Duncan. In fact, I'll, I'll just interview him very briefly, if that's all right. Because not all of you will know Chris, and um, he's a lovely man in many ways. <laughs> Chris, just tell us a little bit about um, what, what you were doing with Woodies before you took your, your career change. Um, yeah, I was a youth minister, so I had the privilege of helping to lead devotion uh, for three very merry years. And you've not quite finished, have you? Um, no, you, I haven't. What are you going to do this summer with, with people from devotion? So I'm taking a team of lovely young people to Romania. Uh, so many of you know we have a partnership with Project Romanian Rescue who um, look after vulnerable and orphaned young people and do lots of great things um, where they are. So um, yeah, taking a group of nine young people and two other semi-responsible adults. So that essentially equates to one responsible adult, which is the bare minimum. Right. And um, so it would be great to be praying for you as you do that, and it's, it's, a, it's often a really life-changing experience for young people when they go. And Chris, what are you going to do next? Tell, and tell us what and why you're up to. So, um, I wasn't kicked out, which is good. Um, there were a cu couple of moments, but um, I'm now working for Bristol City Council. So my official title is Project Development Officer for the Community Resources Team. Um, I've discovered that the council love long words and acronyms and things like that, so I fit right in. Um, but essentially, uh, Mayor Marvin Rees has got a huge heart for social action and community development, and I'm working to help resource that and make that happen. Okay, and, and what, what part of the city have you got a real passion for? Noel West, to be precise. Not Noel East, Noel West. Okay. Um, Having worked there and live nearby and have lots of friends there, that's our heart is to have a bit more time to invest and hopefully see the church grow and kingdom grow in, in that part of the city. Right. Now, if you know Noel West, it is one of the more deprived um, communities in our city. If you've got a heart, interest or passion for Noel West, do talk to uh, Chris, Chris and Nick and their little girl, Poppy lived just on the edge of the estate there, um, uh, just off the broad walk. And they, they just do really care about it. So if you care about it too, talk to Chris. He'd love to hear from you. Yeah, although my daughter's not, not two yet, so I can't imagine her passion for the area is wholly there it's, yet. It's growing. But she'll tell you about her, yeah. her cat. So we thank you nice. for Chris, Lord God, and we, 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 we bless him as he comes to speak to us now. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm just going to get my water. I have this um, really tough dilemma because I find, does anybody else's mouth get really dry when they speak? Yeah. Well, 
that's a tough thing, but I do also have a rare but actually diagnosed syndrome called overactive bladder syndrome, some of you will know. So um, it's a real balance to know how much to drink and how much to not drink. Um, <laughs> if I start to get sort of excitable and, and moving around, it's not because of the work of the Spirit, it's just, it's just that. So um, anyway, just thought I'd... It's always good to put that out there, isn't it? And... Um, <laughs> I usually share relatively useless information when I'm a bit nervous, so hopefully the information uh, value will go up as uh, my confidence goes up. Um, so anyway, low bar to start with. Um, yes, as Dave said, I was youth minister for three years. I had a great time. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful three years, and I got to meet some wonderful people, um, including Rosemary, who Dave mentioned, who... Um, was wonderful in many ways. And one of the things that was big on her agenda was inclusion. Um, She was a real champion for it. And um, I'm just imagining now she's probably um, trying to get sort of better wheelchair access or a hearing loop for Jesus' throne room as we speak. She was that kind of person. She was was determined to ensure that all people, regardless of their... Uh, ability or physical needs, whatever, were able to come into church. So we really bless what she's done. And actually, in the name of inclusion, uh, I'm going to start off my talk by um, sort of sharing a story that's probably a bit more accessible to uh, a particular people group, uh, a people group who are much maligned, often made fun of, often misunderstood. That's right. Geographers. (laughs) Geographers. <laughs> okay, they don't, get, they don't get much in the way of sort of accessible stories or information. So I'm going to start off with that. I want to tell you, particularly you geographers out there, about Mount Pinatubo. Has anybody ever heard of Mount Pinatubo? Oh, yes, Rowena, you're a geographer. I love that. So, and, a, and a few others. So Mount Pinatubo is in the Philippines. Um, for many, many years, it was believed to be um, just your everyday mountain range but actually what people didn't realize is that it was a dormant volcano and in the early 90s um, scientists discovered that it was about to erupt and true to form um, in 1991 Mount Pinatubo went ballistic scientists say it was um, the biggest um, eruption of hot air in the 1990s um, second only to um, the formation of the Spice Girls. So it was a big deal. So big that it caved in on itself 850 feet. So it just blew wide open. Um, People who were local were saying that um, pieces of rock the size of golf balls were flying through the air in utter chaos. Um, Fortunately, scientists foresaw this, managed to get people out and actually the, the death toll wasn't as high as, as you'd expect. So that was good news in itself. But what is most interesting about Mount Pinatubo is actually the effect that it had on the whole globe um, for the couple of years afterwards because um, it flew out 20 million tonnes of sulphur dioxide um, in that space of a few hours. And it was, the force of the eruption was so big that that sulfur dioxide passed the atmosphere of the Earth and went into this thing that scientists called the stratosphere. So literally as, as high up, in, in, up there as you could possibly get. Which meant, as it spread across basically the entire planet, that it, it sort of acted as a bit of a sunscreen. So what happened over the next couple of years is the global temperature dropped by about half a degree centigrade which doesn't sound like much. You know, we we see up and down in in the UK on an hourly basis. But actually, um, in the context, that's incredible. Because actually what that did was reverse 100 years of global warming in the space of two years. Now, that effect didn't last long because we've sort of managed to, um, you know, do our bit to raise the global temperature. But for... A glorious two years, one event, one incredibly eruptive event transformed the whole of the globe. 
the whole of the climate. Now, you must be thinking, why, why is Chris talking about this? Well, this morning we're going to be briefly looking into Galatians, which is in the New Testament, one of the letters that Paul wrote. And we're looking at Galatians 1 and 2. And for me, in the same way that scientists were, and, and still are, interested in how this one eruptive event caused uh, a knock-on effect for the whole planet, Paul was interested, as he writes to the Galatians, in how the effect of Jesus, his life in us, has on our behaviour and our actions. Actually, the effect of Jesus should be eruptive. It should be transformational in the same way that one volcano exploding and, and sending millions of tonnes of sulphur dioxide into the atmosphere should be for us. The reality of what Galatians says and what Paul's trying to say and ultimately who Jesus is, is that when we invite Jesus into our lives, it should be transformational. It should transform our perspective and our purpose. So that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. Actually, this all stems from an identity change. And we're just going to spend the first minute looking at what that identity, identity change is all about. So if we could just flick up that passage or that verse from Galatians 2. That would be great. And if you want to turn to your Bibles, then by all means. But this is, this is really, in my view at least, the centre of, of what Paul is talking about. What actually happens to us when we invite Jesus into our lives? What actually happens to us when we say yes to following Jesus? He says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, in other words, we are not sitting here as Christians by title alone. There's actually something that happens when we say we're Christians. There's something that happens when we say yes to Jesus. Our lives, the things that consume us, the things that perhaps are shaping where we see our destiny and our future, no longer apply in the same way. As Paul said there, is Christ in us? That is our ultimate identity. That's our ultimate sense of being and, and who we are. But again, that's not just something for us to hold on to, not just something for us to be comfortable with or say, well done, that's fantastic. That should be transformational. That should change the way we see things, and the way we do things. Mount Pinatubo's effect, as I said, was temporary. And I'm not a scientist or a geographer, so I don't know the effect um, totally of climate change, but it was temporary. But Jesus' effect on people, um, when genuine, is eternal. But it doesn't mean we wait for it to happen in eternity. It starts now, which is great news. So my challenge and my question to myself, as well as all of us here, is has Jesus transformed you? Has the life of Jesus transformed you? Has what Paul said there in Galatians 2.20, Christ living in you, made a difference? In other words, has he been like that Mount Pinatubo effect? Has he been like an eruption in your life, disruptive, but ultimately full of incredible change? Or has it been more like a damp squib, more like a rainy Sunday afternoon listening to a B-side collection of Spice Girls on an old cassette player? That's my challenge. And I think it's an everyday challenge, isn't it? How is Jesus transforming me today? 
what is changing in me. So we're going to look at that. And we're just going to look at that from two very simple points. Has Jesus transformed my perspective? And has Jesus transformed my purpose? I've decided I'm going in. I can already feel the activity. Stave it off, Lord. Okay. So perspective. Let's just look at that second um, couple of verses from Galatians 1. So going back near the beginning of, of the letter. Paul says this. For I would have you know, brothers... That the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man. Nor was, I ta- nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. First and foremostly, if you want transformation in your life, if you want to see something change, like Paul, you actually need to have a meeting, an encounter, or as Paul says it there, a revelation of who Jesus is. Because at the end of the day, you can't love somebody you've never met. So when I was reading this, it made me think of uh, the birth of our daughter, Poppy. As Dave mentioned, we have a lovely daughter um, who's about 20 months old. And so it's still relatively fresh in my memory. Um, I always laugh because um, I'm sure Nick won't mind saying this, but... Um, she had an assisted delivery, so we had to go into a theatre, and uh, the midwife drew out of a selection of um, CDs for us to play. No Spice Girls, unfortunately, but um, the first CD was White Flag by Dido. I thought, that's not really very appropriate for someone going through labour, but never mind. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't up for the choice. So there we go, flick it on. So as Dido, White Flag was playing, Nick gave birth to Poppy, and um, because Nick was in theatre, I was um, the first of the two of us to meet Poppy. And for anyone who's been through that, they'll know what an incredibly magic and you know, profound moment that is. But just imagine if somebody had said, you've got a daughter named Poppy, but you haven't met her and, and you never will. Imagine how my perspective would be different. Oh, yeah, Poppy's good, I guess. Um, you know, her favourite things are being a baby and other things. I would, I would know nothing about her. And I wouldn't have the same feeling of love. I wouldn't have the same commitment to her as I do now. And it's the same with Jesus, in a way. Um, if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't had a revelation of who Jesus is, then you don't actually know what makes him tick. You don't know what his values are, and it's hard to fall in love and want to follow somebody that you don't know. And yet, I think over the years, over the centuries in church, we've made quite a good fist of having Christianity without Jesus. And actually, it doesn't work. It's like Mike Pilavachi says, who we see every year at Soul Survivor, being, having a Christian without Christ is just Ian. <laughs> and do you know any Ians that you really like? <laughs> Are there any Ians in the, in the building? Lovely, great. Let's carry on then. <laughs> no, I have a cousin called Ian. He's, he's all right, but he's not Jesus. And... The point is, if you want to try and do Christianity without having that revelation of Jesus, then it's just religion. And it's just law. It's just trying to do the next thing okay. And Paul refers to that because he talks about, you know, new Christians not being, having to be circumcised. And then later in Galatians, he talks about freedom in Christ. You can't have any of that without having a revelation of Jesus. Now, Paul's actual revelation of Jesus was very extreme, um, more than your average encounter. He met with the risen Lord, and he was even blinded by it. So you may be asking yourself, well, I'm not going to have that. How am I supposed to meet Jesus? Well, in my experience, having grown up through church and 
you know, done the whole trying to be a Christian without really knowing Jesus, there's probably two places or two people that you need to be acquainted with. The first is the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus, when he left the disciples, said, I'm leaving you with the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit reveals who Jesus is. And there's no entry-level examination to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can be filled wherever, but the church is a wonderful place to start. So if you've never asked anybody to pray for you and ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, then do that today. But also, if you want to know Jesus, then read the Bible. I, I obviously, as you know, have worked with young people for the last three years, and I think one of the biggest challenges of ministry anywhere, but particularly with young people, is people just read less. And we are reading the Bible less. We are less Bible literate. And yet, everything that you need to know about Jesus is in there. So if you want to have your perspective changed, do word and do spirit together. We also need our purpose to be transformed. And let's just go to the final little extract and read what Paul has to say. So just a few verses later, he says this. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Note, again, Paul talks about revelation. You know, it only starts when the son is revealed to him. But read Galatians, it's amazing because Paul talks about how he went from being this man who persecuted the church, who took delight in putting Christians away, to meeting Jesus, to actually being one of the most influential church planting people ever. If that's not a transformation of purpose, then nothing is. A total U-turn in, in, in his purpose. So again, my question I often ask to myself, and that I'm asking you today, is if someone asks you, what's your purpose? What's the point? What's the big idea? What would you say? Now again, this is not about flashy works or um, achieving great accomplishments, because actually Paul makes it very clear again throughout those two chapters that we are saved by our faith and not by our works. However, we should be known by some change in the way we do things, the way we interact with each other, even on a basic level. And actually, if you took all of us here and had a transformed purpose, imagine what could be done just in this city alone. Paul talks about remembering the poor. You know, God has a huge heart for those who are vulnerable, for those who have been marginalized, not geographers, those who've been genuinely marginalized. So part of our transformation, as well as a transformation just within ourselves, is also how do we treat people who have been left out? How do we include people who are different to us? You know, it shouldn't just be Rosemary who's banging that drum about how we offer an invite into love, into charity, into acceptance, into community. That should be, that should be for all of us. So, really, that's it. Um, usually I have a lot to say, but it turns out this time I've kept it in time. But my point is, when, when, when Paul met Jesus, you can read about it in Acts 9, there was a transformation of perspective instantly. I mean, he was blinded at first, but when, it, when the scales were taken from his eyes, he, he saw Jesus in a different way, but he also saw um, Christians in a different way. He saw the church in a different way. He saw life in a different way, and that led to a change in purpose. And so it's worth asking ourselves, are we letting Jesus be 
like that Mount Pinatubo eruption? Or are we just sort of carrying on, carrying on, carrying on? I'm just going to finish with a story about my beloved grandmother, who um, is both an animal lover to the extremes, but also a die-hard meat eater. I've always not understood that juxtaposition, but she's a lovely, lovely lady. But one thing she, she could not understand um, is when I told her that I was going vegan. Um, this was about a couple of years ago. I decided I've got to do something, and uh, that's it. My wife and I went for it. We went to VegFest, and we thought, this is, it can't be that hard, you know? But probably the hardest bit was convincing my grandmother it was a good idea. So I remember being on the phone to her and talking about my plant-based motives, trying to reassure her that you can still eat cake and be a vegan. It's okay. Um, she thought I was going to wither away. And I thought I was getting her around to the idea that this, this thing is a good idea. But um, I realized I'd failed when sort of towards the climax of the conversation, there was a short pause. And her response was, so let me get this straight. You're going to be one of those vegans who eats meat. <laughs> no, Grandma. She's still, still getting her head around it. My point is, Galatians and what Paul's trying to do is actually address a gap between identity and behaviors and values in the same way that my grandmother couldn't quite get that sort of jump between actually being called something and doing something about it. Paul was primarily interested in, in getting a hold of a pe group of people who had assumed the identity of being followers of Jesus, but perhaps had lapsed into an old way of life, into thinking that doing things was the right answer or being circumcised was like an entry-level thing. And it's the same for us today. It may not be circumcision, but we may feel that dressing a certain way in church is the right way, or um, I've just got to do this in order to find favor with God. But actually, the gospel, as Paul says, is based on the fact that we are saved by faith, but that it should have a cumulative effect on who we are, our perspective, and what we do. So my prayer for myself for my family, but also for us as a family, is to be filled with the Spirit in order for us to do that and um, to have the courage and bravery to actually ask those questions of each other. So why don't we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent Jesus to... Um, to be crucified so that it would no longer be us who live, but Christ in us. And I thank you that that is actually something we can experience in reality, that you live in us, you make home in us, your spirit is in us, and, and that leads to a transformation of the way we see things, the way we see other people, but also the things we do. And I want to pray, God, that... Um, your spirit would fill us all and teach us how to be more like you, Jesus. Amen.